English Mayavadis, not knowing that the Krishna consciousness movement is based on a solid philosophy of transcendental science, superficially conclude that those who dance and chant do not have philosophical knowledge. Those who are Krishna conscious actually have full knowledge of the essence of Vedanta philosophy. First, they study the real commentary in the Vedanta philosophy, Srimad Bhagavatam, and follow the actual words of the Supreme Personality of Godhead as found in Bhagavad Gita as it is. After understanding the Bhagavad philosophy or Bhagavad Dharma, they become fully spiritually conscious or Krishna conscious. Therefore, their chanting and dancing is not material, but is on the spiritual platform. Although everyone admires the ecstatic chanting and dancing of the devotees, who are therefore popularly known as the Hare Krishna people, Mayavadis cannot appreciate these activities because of their poor fund of knowledge. I'll just be using this uh, tablet as a writing pad to draw and explain some things. of the Bhakti movement and that conceptual clash that goes on today that is being depicted here. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has come to, Jit uh, to Varanasi and while he is dancing with his uh, associates performing ecstatic kirtans, the Mayavadi sannyasis are deriding him. He is just a sentimentalist. Bhavu kahiya, he becomes a sentimentalist. Bhavu ke rasane. He is just spending time with other sentimentalists. So, I talk about this verse. Oh, what is being? How do I? How do we open it? With the face ID, maybe we can just disable that. <coughs> so I talk about from three broad perspectives. First, the philosophical perspective, what is going on over here. Then the historical perspective of how things have changed and yet not changed. And then finally, from a practical perspective. So we. Practical means a contemporary perspective today. So philosophically, the idea here is that those who are impersonalists, specifically the Mayavadis, they consider they consider devotees to be less intelligent, devotees to be sentimental. So 
Do you have any other app like Evernote or OneNote or something that I can just scroll the page and keep drawing down? I have no other app. I can download it. Okay, no. These are uh, free form. Free form is there. Free form. Free form. Free form. Okay. So basically, from the time of Shankaracharya, who appeared around 7th century, Shankaracharya established that Brahman, or he tried to establish that Brahman is not just the supreme reality, Brahman is the only reality. And Brahma Satya Jagan Mitya. That everything else is false. But he himself soon recognized that for most people, the idea of meditating on a impersonal, qualityless, activityless Brahman is actually extremely difficult. So they started having the idea that you can practice bhakti and you can worship a form of the Lord. But you worship till you become enlightened enough to then start focusing on the impulse. So they gave a subordinate status to the personal manifestation of the Lord. <coughs> Can you explain that? Can you see how we do it? So, you can directly write on this white canvas and it's called like Amin. Oh, really? So, basically, See, the bhakti understanding is that there is one absence. Wait, how do I write The letters are coming over here. Yeah. Remove the letters. Don't do that. Need the old-fashioned platform. It is going to be this one. Yeah, it's going to be the other one. I don't want it to be letters. Okay, okay. Okay. So this is the one app. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to figure that. You happen. can open a note note app just <laughs> to default. You don't have to experiment over here somehow. Right. Just be a strong man. So we are, the bhakti understanding, which is based on the Vedanta Sutra and the Bhagavatam, is that it's funny. It's one absolute truth, and it has three different aspects. So there is the Bhagavan aspect, there is the Paramatma aspect, and there is the Brahman aspect. And all these three are actually, they are non different at one level. It is the same, same one reality which is known differently based on different levels of realization. And of course the highest level of realization is Bhagavan. But it is not that Brahman is lower. It is just that when that absolute truth is known by one of its features, then it is called as Brahman. Say for example, suppose there is some delicacy like a gulab jam after this program. Now, when we, when we get the first the fragrance of the gulab jam, everybody knows what a gulab jam is, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. well it's, so, devotional good. So the, when we first get the fragrance of the gulab jam, then we see the gulab jam, and then we taste the gulab jam. Now, even when we get the fragrance of the gulab jamun, it is still the gulab jamun. It is only that we are experiencing only one feature of the gulab jamun. That is its fragrance. So, the absolute truth is one. But when we experience only one aspect of the absolute truth, that is, it is eternal. Then that level of realization is called as Brahman. Mm -hmm. But when we see the gulab jamun, you are not just smell, smelling it, but also seeing it. So then there is a greater experience of the gulab jam. So similarly, when we understand that the absolute truth is not just having a personal aspect, is not just eternal, but also has consciousness, then that is called as the Paramatma.
Do you drink some things? Yeah. There's a note there, please. You can open the apple notes. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> There's so many apples. It's a lot of function. No, no, no. I think you can just rub, rub it. Yeah, that one. Yeah. This one? Yeah. This one. Yes, sir. That's good. Yeah, it's like a bigger pump. Sorry, all this. Oh god. <laughs> ஜாமுன்ஜி That is the same gulab jamun, but experience different. So, uh, and when you see, smell, and taste it, it's like the ultimate reality. We understand that it's eternal, it's conscious, and it is reciprocal. That sat, chit, and ananda is filled with joy and gives us joy through loving reciprocation. So that is Bhagwan. So we understand it's one absolute truth with three different features, and each feature realized at a different level of realization. So it is not that Brahman is lower and Bhagwan is higher. It is Brahman and Bhagwan are the same thing, but Brahman is a lower level of realization. It is not that Brahman is lower. I hope the difference is clear. Suppose just to um, illustrate this point, say gulab jamun. If suppose when we just smell gulab jamun, we never tasted it, and we give a name for that object. So oh, we call it you know, fragrance. No. and so then the fragrance and the gulab jamun are the same thing but at that time because we have only experienced the fragrance we call it fragrance but suppose we uh suppose we see the gulab jamun then we call it a fragrance sphere so now it is still the same gulab jamun but based on that experience we have given it a particular name so to put it another way thank you so there's one absolute truth okay absolute truth there's one absolute truth but based on how much we realize it so if only the sat aspect is realized it's brahman if the sat and chit are realized then it is parmatma and sat sat chit and ananda all three are realized then it is bhagwan So, vadanti tat sattva vidha sattvam yad gyanam adhyayam. Adhyayam means these three are non-different. So now, philosophically, we have two categories of impersonalists. Which are the two categories? Anyone remember the terms? Sanskrit. Two categories of impersonalists, not two levels. Brahma vadis and Maya vadis. So, Brahma vadis. Now the difference between the two of them is that if we consider this on level of realizing this is Brahman, this is Bhagwan. Brahman is Bhagwan. So the Brahma Vadis prefer this. They don't deny or deride or falsify Bhagwan. They just say we are attracted to the impersonal aspect. Maybe the personal is there. Maybe whatever the personal is, we are not attracted to it. So this idea, if it's only a matter of personal preference, then this is non-offensive. And Krishna talks about this in twelve point three to five in the Bhagavad Gita. And here he says they will also attain me. They will attain me in the form of Brahm, in the ancestors Brahman, but. This process is klesho dikhtaras dikhtaras. It's a troublesome process. It's a gradual process. Hmm? But the Mayavadis are somewhat different. What they say is, Brahman is the only reality, and they say everything else is false. And then they say that in the domain of falsity, there are various levels of falsity. So. This Brahman plus Sattva. When Brahman is covered by the mode of goodness, that manifests as Bhagwan. 
Brahman plus Rajas. Oh, there are different theories. I'm just taking one theory of Mayavad because Mayavadis Maya, Maya, say everything is one, but all Mayavadis are not one <laughs> because they have different opinions. <laughs> so there are big conflicts even among Mayavadis. But Brahm, Brahman plus Rajas, they say, is Jiva. When Brahman is covered by the mode of passion, then it becomes a Jiva. And when Brahman is covered by Tamas, it becomes matter. It becomes property. So now their idea is even Bhagawan is Maya. But they say this is helpful Maya. Or it is a useful fiction. The idea is that the Jiva has to merge with Brahman. That is the final explanation. But most Jivas cannot directly dwell on the impersonal absolute. So their idea is temporarily worship. So if this is the Jiva, this is Bhagawan. So they say the Jiva can perform Bhakti temporarily. Till they realize, now they realize something. What they realize? Normally, nowadays, the modern Mayavad, see Mayavad is a deviation from Vedic philosophy. And modern Mayavad is even a deviation from Mayavad. Because modern Mayavad often say that I am God. There's one Mayavadi teacher who came. He says, this is the age of egalitarianism. So in the past, there are many gurus who came and said that I am God. He said, I am not like that. I have not come to tell you I am God. I have come to tell you, you are God. <laughs> so, now when this idea is there, so they say you are God. But actually, or I am God or you are God. But their ultimate understanding is, I am an illusion and God is an illusion. So, the idea is that... So this is the ultimate reality Brahman. And from that Brahman, there is the Chatakash and Patakash. The small sky and big sky. This is Jiva. This is Bhagavan. And when the two, when there is a relationship of Bhakti among the two, the result of this will be eventually the jiva will realize that I am false and Bhagawan is false. And all that exists is the stream of consciousness between the two. If this is false, then Bhakti is also false. Basically, what will happen is my sense of I-ness is an illusion. God's sense of I-ness is also an illusion. And the ultimate reality is there is just the merging into the infinite existence of Brahman. So their idea is that this is required, bhakti is required for so generally if we consider this for the other way, let's understand their idea of preparation. See normally whenever there is perception, there is a subject say for example, I am looking at you so I am the subject and say you are the object so I, you are looking at me, I am looking at you so the perceiver is the subject, the perceived is the object. And in between is the stream of consciousness. So their idea is that, so their idea is that the subject is false, the object is false. And the only reality is the stream of consciousness. And that stream of consciousness is what we are meant to be. They are meant to realize that we are. And according to them, liberation means to realize both that I am an illusion, God is an illusion, and the reality exists beyond both those illusions. So there, sometimes uh, Prabhupada would refer to Mayavada as atheistic. But they don't say we are atheistic, they say we are transtheistic. We are transcendental to theism. The theism is a preliminary thing, we go beyond the idea of God. So now from that, why am I mentioning all this? Because what the Mayavadis say, so this Mayavad is considered offensive because they are saying that the form of the Lord is Maya. And that is, that, that Lord's form is the supreme object of devotion, the supreme shelter. To call that as Maya is offensive. And this particular, philosophy Krishna talks about 9, 11, 12, he also talks about 7, 24. It says, Avajananti Mamudha, Mogha Mogha Karmano. He talks about this. So, now from their perspective, if somebody is worshipping the Lord, somebody is practicing Bhakti, that means that they, that that person is not evolved enough to realize that I am Brahman. 
therefore their idea is bhakti is preliminary to jnana that you practice bhakti till you get the jnana that you are one with brahman and then you go beyond bhakti that is their idea so they consider therefore that anybody who is still practicing bhakti is is at a preliminary level you are not advanced enough to understand that you are a spiritual being that you are that, that you are that non differentiated oneness that is brahman and therefore they say those who are bhaktas they are less intelligent they have not yet realized the ultimate reality now of course this idea that bhakti is for a lower level of spiritual realization this itself is open to question right after shankaracharya came up with his thesis then ramacharya right from the beginning has critiqued it and subsequent acharyas the sub acharyas the vaishnav tradition pointed out that this idea that there is a two level reality that there is what he call it brahman as the parmarthi the only reality and everything else is illusory this itself is not mentioned in the scripture this two level categorization of scripture but this is their idea and this idea was very widespread and therefore they consider the bhakti is for less intelligent people and generally their understanding is to to function in the world you have to see duality this is wealth this is poverty this is this is comfort this is discomfort so their idea is actual spirituality begins with sanyas it is only when somebody has renounced the world then one can start spiritual spiritual before that it's just like a practice run before that is practicing for that purpose and therefore while common people may be practicing bhakti this is good for them but a sanyasi practicing bhakti that they find especially objection that people were doing kirtan over there bhajan over there they didn't mind that but for a sanyasi to do that you are meant to be renounced you are meant to the very fact that you have taken sanyas means you have gone beyond illusion including the illusion that there is a duality between you and god and therefore they say that if you as a sanyasi are doing this that you are a sentimentalist so basically what the mayavadis do is that they invert the hierarchy they say brahman is the highest and bhagwan is not even lower it is illusory just till you go to the brahman to the the bhagwan to brahman level rather mm-hmm. so for them brahman is not as i said not this the highest reality the only reality and then bhagwan is somewhere here so like bhagwan is a step on the ladder so bhagwan is here jiva is here and prakriti is here so the idea is that the jiva is attached to prakriti so this attached this is detachment and then to bring about this detachment the jiva can attach himself to bhagwan and that is bhakti but bhakti is like a stepping stone on the ladder so in, if if you are here you come up to here and once you come up to here then you go here and when you go here just as when one rejects the material world and understand its maya and understand the jiva is maya then understand the bhagwan is maya and one enters into the oneness of brahman so now this idea it does not have much philosophy and particularly any scriptural basis but it's a very appealing idea to the particularly to the intellectual mind because sometimes the intellectual mind loves to analyze loves to philosophize and it likes to go beyond externals like this worship of a form that is external you have to go beyond it so now with this this is the philosophical understanding of what is going on over here now next part i'll take is historical now historically what happened is that so initially the mayavadis taught only pure jnana but then they realized jnana alone is not appealing to a large number it is it's very very few who can just focus on oh the only thing to think is that there is nothing to think the only thing to do is that there is nothing to do the only thing to desire is that there is nothing to desire so that is very difficult practically impossible but it's very difficult for most people so they said subsequently so this was if you say we start on the 7th century when 
Now, of course, Mayavad existed before that also, but Shankaracharya was the person who propagated it quite, quite forcefully across the world. It said jnana plus bhakti. And bhakti is temporarily done. So I put it in bracket because it's an illusion, which you ultimately have to give up. But then they found that bhakti was becoming more and more widespread. Yes, then they said, okay, bhakti is for less intelligent people. So you practice it right now, but ultimately you go get it. So there is a common slogan over Mayavadi Bhagavad Chaitanyera Patha Shankarera Mata. So Chaitanyera Patha means follow the path of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. That is chant, chanting, dancing, singing. That's very nice. It's easy, it's joyful. But Shankarera Mata. The purpose is you ultimately get the realization of Shankara Chaitanya. That is, you have to go beyond Bhakti. You have to go beyond Bhagavan. You have to merge with Brahma. Now this was quite an insidious idea. So Brahmavadi is their fight, that their preference, that's okay. But here it is deriding, it is it is minimizing and therefore misleading. So historically, as things move forward, there are two main things that happened. One was that the bhakti movement started spreading very widely. And the bhaktas started establishing how Bhakti is also grounded in great philosophy. But basically the Advaita Vad was like the benchmark of intellectual intellectuality. Just like in today's world, science is the benchmark for most intelligent people. So as soon as you talk about the soul, as soon as you talk about God, you say people say that. Is this scientific? Is there a scientific proof for this? So just as science has a strong hold on people's minds today, for nearly a millennia, Advaita Vad had a strong hold on people's mind. So as soon as somebody will talk anything about philosophy, anything about Vedanta, you say, okay, but what about Advaita Vad? Is this, is this in harmony with Advaita Vad? So it was a very difficult challenge for the Vaishnava Acharyas to challenge, to counter it. And sometimes when we read Acharya's commentary, we read Prabhupada's commentary. Sometimes we feel Prabhupada is so fixated on Mayavad, constantly refuting Mayavad, constantly refuting Mayavad. The point is that Prabhupada is a teacher in a long tradition where the tradition was constantly minimized and derided by Mayavad. Now, we, in that context, we'll understand now Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's strategy, how he deals with it. So basically, when Chaitanya Mahaprabhu goes, this is a very poor map of India. But <laughs> please forgive me. So anyway, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is in Pudra Goga. So say somewhere here this is Jagannath Puri. So Mahaprabhu went from here, from Varanasi, this is a Aljum, this is an extremely approximation. From Varanasi he went to Vrindavan. So initially this happened, he went from Varanasi to Vrindavan and the Mayavadi was criticizing him, he didn't care for the movie. He smiled and walked away from there. He went to Vrindavan. Fahiya Mathura. He went to Mathura and then he came back. And this time, when he came back to Varanasi, so he went like this, then he came back over here. This is the time when he encountered the Maya place. Now generally, whenever we have to resolve a conflict or we have to address somebody who has a misconception, if we just start by telling you are wrong, and that raises that person's defense. That raises the person's defenses. And then they're not ready to listen to any argument. So the way Mahaprabhu dealt with the Mayavad, as we described in subsequent verses, is very expert. So the first thing is that finally when an arrangement was made, there was a Maharashtra Brahmana who, who invited the Mayavadis and they invited Mahaprabhu also. So when Mahaprabhu went over there, First thing is, see if, say if this is our understanding, this is somebody else's understanding. Now, that their understanding and our understanding are different. But if we want to have any kind of communication, communication that will lead to transformation, then we have to find some intersection point. Something that we agree on. If there is nothing that two people can agree on, then there is no basis for a discussion. If we start, say, arguing based on Shastra, and the other person doesn't accept Shastra authority, 
then how can we have any discussion on all of it? If, if somebody starts, we are, start talking based on science, and the person says, I don't believe science. Okay, unless there is some common foundation, there cannot be any discussion. So Mahaprabhu started with common foundation. When he came there, he, he offered his respects to sannyasis, and then he sat down at the place where everyone would wash their feet. And what was Mahaprabhu doing over here? Maha, and then, because he was sannyasi, he had the fulgits, and he also manifested the Brahmani fulgits. So sannyasi got the Maya of sannyasi got attracted to him. And then they said, "Why are you sitting there? Please come and sit with us." He said, "No, actually, I am from a lower sampradaya. I am hina sampradaya. So now, for us, we say, what is the sampradaya? It's like you now somebody is." Somebody is a graduate from Cambridge, and then somebody is a graduate from some other ordinary college. If somebody who doesn't know the caliber of Cambridge, they say, both of you are graduates from the Big League. But those of Cambridge, they say, you know, we are like, we are a different tattoo. We are a different species. Especially in America, I don't know how, how much it is, but in America, somebody from Yale or any of the Ivy Leagues, there's a there's an elitist mentality there. So, although my Mahaprabhu was sannyasi, and they were also sannyasi, says, I am from a Hina Sampradaya. And they appreciated his humility. And they said, yeah, but you are sannyasi. Why are you, why are you chanting and answering like this? And then he said, that actually when I took sannyas, my guru told me that I am a fool. And I cannot do anything except chanting. Therefore, I am following my guru. Now, what is Mahaprabhu doing over here? First thing is, he is again, playing into their conception that bhakti is for less intelligent people. And then he is also saying that I am following my Guru. Even the Mayavadis recognize that you have to follow your Guru. Of course their idea is that ultimately you and your Guru both are illusion and everything is Brahman. Sure. But before that you have to follow your Guru. So Mahaprabhu was finding areas of agreement. Even if there is 99% disagreement between us and the other person. If we want any communication, we need to start with the 1% area of agreement. If we start with the 99% area of disagreement, then the disagreement won't just be disagreement. It will become destruction. It will become character assassination. It can degenerate into terrible things. So Mahaprabhu started with that agreement. He said, yes, I'm not very intimate. I'm a lower sampradaya. My guru said that I am joined. So by all, And the fourth thing was, he said that he exhibited Brahman. So they were attracted by him. They were charmed by him. And then when they started, when he started having a philosophical discussion, then they were somewhat open to him. And when he started speaking philosophy, he started explaining Vedanta, then they realized he is no fool. <coughs> he knows Vedanta, and they, as they were hearing, they realized that actually he knows Vedanta better than us. The one characteristic of in India, there is a lot of intellectual, uh, there's a healthy tradition of intellectual polemics. People have intellectual debates. But while there were arguments, there's also intellectual honesty. Intellectual honesty means that if your argument is better than mine, then I will accept what you're saying. Not that somehow or the other, I am going to stick to my point. There's an American comedian who said that, I have already made up my mind. Now don't confuse me with the facts. <laughs> what have you made your mind up on? Isn't it? So, there's intellectual dishonesty where a person just sticks to their view no matter how thoroughly their worldview is, their view or their worldview is challenged and falsified. But Prakasha and Saraswati, when he heard Mahaprabhu speak, then, then he understood what is real Prakash, what is real Ananda, and what is real Saraswati. So he became enlightened. That was the glory of Mahaprabhu. So Mahaprabhu, he transformed, but he did not transform simply by, by intellectual brilliance. Along with intellectual brilliance, there was relational brilliance. Relational brilliance means that Mahaprabhu, he, 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 by his humility and by his conduct, he if not charmed, at least open their hearts. And this is very important. If there is to be if there is to be effective or transformative communication, 
Sometimes we think I just need to have a better argument. That is important, but it requires another thing. That is, that is relational brilliance. One has to speak in a way that opens people's minds, not shuts their mind. And then after all that, of course, intellectual brilliance is required. Krishna mentions this in discipline of speech in the Bhagavad Gita. In 17.15, he talks about discipline of speech. Anudvega karam bhakyam satyam priyaritam chayat. He says that we need to be sensitive in our speech. And then also we need to be sensible. Both of them are required. This is 17.15 discipline of speech in the Bhagavad Gita. And Mahaprabhu very much exhibits this. So that is the historical part. Now the third part, which I will conclude is the contemporary part. So what does this mean in today's world? So, uh, basically, we are defined, Prabhupada also writes in the Parbhuri, we are known as the Hare Krishnas, and we go and dance and sing in the streets. And generally, when we dance and sing, people, many people join, they also enjoy the dancing and singing, and they are known as the Hare Krishnas. There was some survey done in America about what people think about the Hare Krishnas. Hmm? Uh, and a lot of people were asked and people gave different replies but there was one reply which was a reply of more than 60 to 70 percent of the these are common American people who were asked those who at least knew something about Hare Krishnas so they said there's a jolly bunch of impractical people <laughs> <laughs> and jolly people they dance and sing <laughs> just dancing and singing what has that got to do with our practical life it's impractical people now, is that the perception we want of our movement? The yeah, jolly part is nice, but we don't want to be seen as impractical. So, our move, the bhakti tradition has many different aspects to it. And while we chant and dance on the streets, we also have a beautiful culture behind it. Not only that, we have a profound philosophy associated with it. And even today, if the only interaction that people have with us is of seeing us chanting and dancing. Then they will start, they will think, okay, as I said, nice people, but not very practical. So they won't think that we have any wisdom, any insights, any practices that can address the real problems of life. For them, the real problems are not of life are not birth, old age, disease, and death. For them, the real problems are life, maybe climate change, maybe inequity, maybe poverty, maybe war maybe discrimination, mm. all those are, for them are the real problems of life. So, it is important that we as devotees have a multifaceted approach in our presentation of Bhakti. So, this is the Bhakti movement. Then, there are many different ways in which the Bhakti movement can reach people. So, chanting and, dance, chanting and dancing is one way. But along with that, what are the other ways in which you are reaching out to people? Are we reaching out to people in a way which gives us, say, intellectual respectability? So that could happen by, it's one, of course, Prabhupada wanted that, but Prabhupada also anticipated this. So what happened in India was, when the devotees were in Kirtan in Bengal, some people started throwing money at the devotees. And in India, Kirtan was basically like a beggar's profession. Uh, you, you sing some songs, please people, and people use them charity. When Prabhupada saw that, Prabhupada said, stop some people. He said, we don't want to be lumped in with beggars. He says, right. I think we don't have anything against beggars. But they are also parts of Krishna. But we don't want to, people think that we are that. So he, he was concerned about public perception. Now, sometimes people say, I don't care what people think about me. I was in America and I saw one, one student and he had this t-shirt. Emblazoned. I don't care what the world thinks about me. But then, they are announcing that to the world. <laughs> they care that the world knows I don't care about you. <laughs> so, actually we live in a social, we are social beings. Even as devotees, we can't live in an isolated transcendental bubble. So, we, we can't say that I don't care about the world thinks about us. We do care. Otherwise, how will we reach out to people? Now, that does not mean that we change our core principles just because the world doesn't approve them. But if there are some avoidable misconceptions or avoidable preconceptions, 
then we need to take the endeavor to avoid them. So, if we consider people's perceptions of us, so should we care for people's perceptions? Yes, we should be mindful. But this is yes. Don't make the mind full of people's perceptions. Hmm. That is not the only thing we think of that. Hmm. So yes, some things which we do, people may not like at all. But that doesn't mean we can stop chanting or we can stop worshipping the deities. No, but if some things are preconceptions or misconceptions that are coming and we can avoid them, then there's nothing wrong with that. To be aware of it and to, to, try, try some, to do something to avoid it. So Prabhupada complemented book distribution, sorry, Sankirtan with book distribution. So our books, they are well written, they have philosophy. And people <coughs> see those books, okay, these people are not just some, some impractical people, just some religious nuts. <coughs> and similarly, in our, in our classes, in our interaction with people, if people see that, okay, these people are intelligent. So the the chanting and dancing may well be the first impression and that may well be the first and positive impression. So again, the same thing that happened in Mahaprabhu's times, that happens today also. You know, broadly, we can say, society can be divided into two broad parts. That is what can be called as class and that is mass. So mass outreach which Mahaprabhu did was just go around India, chant and dance and inspire everyone to chant and dance. He had a magnetic personality by which what he could do was extraordinary. But along with that, Mahaprabhu also had a class outreach. If you see, in one sense, Mahaprabhu went to South India. But after he left South India, well, there is not much of a legacy of Gaudiya Vaishnavism there. He went to North India. And Prakashan Saraswati was transformed. But what happened after that? Well, again, Mayavadis came and Mayavadis started uh, controlling. Prabhupada said that when Varanasi is like the Vrindavan of the Mayavadis. That is the headquarters. That is where all Mayavadis are. But where did Mahaprabhu leave a lasting legacy? Where there was class outreach following this Mahaprabhu's outreach. Mahaprabhu spent time with the Goswamis. He instructed Rupa Goswami, he instructed Sanatana Goswami. And being carried on the legacy. In Vrindavan, the legacy continued. Then we have, apart from that, we also have Mahaprabhu's conversation with Ramanand Rai. And Jagannath Puri, there is a lot of literature that is written. So in Odia, in Orissa in India, in Bengal in India, in Vrindavan in India. In these three places, Kauriya Vishnu is still an active force. And that is because Mahaprabhu created a class legacy. Now class does not necessarily mean that people have intellectuals alone. But people are influential in different ways. And that is what we also need to do. There is mass outreach and there is class outreach. So Mahaprabhu did both. We also need to do both. So if you do only mass outreach, a lot of masses will come. But they may not stay because they are often driven by sentiment. So there is, there is a, I'll conclude with this point. When they say that bhaktas are sentimentalists, there is a truth to it and there is a falsity to it. I'll explain that, how that works that if we consider bhakti and sentimentality. So at one level, are it, is, it, is, it, is it sentimental people who are attracted to bhakti? Yes. Hmm? It does attract sentimentalists. Bhakti does attract people who are sentimentalists, who may not be attracted to philosophy. Hmm? However, no, because bhakti attracts philosophers also. Those are non-sentimental. Not, I'm not using the word unsentimental. Because even devotees have sentiments. But they are not driven or controlled by sentiments. So it is true that is bhakti for the less intelligent people? Yes, bhakti is for the less intelligent people. But is bhakti only for the less intelligent people? No. Bhakti is for everyone. Bhakti is the summit of enlightenment. It is the highest realization of the absolute truth. And people need to be able to see that. that okay, yeah, common people chant and dance and sing and that's wonderful. Mm -hmm. In India especially and all over the world, there's a 
resurgence of devotional music in india uh, the the there's a bar. india is well known in the world for bollywood and the bollywood has music but actually the second biggest youtube channel in india is a channel of bhakti music and it is bigger than some of the biggest bollywood houses also so bollywood music channel also and it is i think among the top 50 youtube channels in the whole entire world and significantly in these top 50 channels there are seven christian music channels and there are two islamic islam doesn't have so much music but there are that's so all the point is that religious music religious singing this is something which attracts a lot of people and we as a movement have the resources to tap that potential and we are doing that however most of these people who hear religious music you know they will they hear religious music for some time and after that they turn off up and then start hearing sensual music hey this is entertaining that is also entertaining this is stimulating that is also stimulating there not much difference so if we want to go beyond sentimentalism if we want to go beyond bhakti just makes me feel good yes bhakti makes us feel good but bhakti also makes us become good it transforms us for that we need to complement the sentimental with the philosophical and people who are thoughtful people who are reflective people who are intelligent they also need to see that in, in the devotee community there are intelligent people there are philosophical people there are people who engage with mainstream social issues and they can address those social issues in a responsible way i have been here for one month now in this last maximum time i spent in uk till now and i was looking talking to this devotee that i to understand the history of our movement here so so uk is the place where our movement in the western world has got the maximum mainstream acceptance in india iskon is a very respected brand now hmm? i mean politicians and industrialists they want to work with us for various in social initiatives apart from that in the rest of the world it has not happened so much but in uk it has happened remarkably and one of the reasons is that devotees here have invested time in connecting with the mainstream not just chanting and singing but maybe going to mainstream initiatives you know they invited say there's a general hindu festival so we go and speak over there and we don't just preach krishna consciousness over there we talk values which make sense to the audience to the politicians to everyone else and then you see your link this person makes sense what this person speaks is actually sensible i was you know shruti prabhu was here i was talking with him he says when you i asked him when you go to the parliament or something they asked to speak what do you speak at that point so he says that if i want to speak on diwali so diwali is a festival of gratitude one of the point he said that you know and we are grateful to our country because it has given us the religious freedom by which we can practice our our tradition our religion our bhakti and this is something which a general british person can also appreciate okay you have your tradition and you practice it over it so we have to find out ways in which not every interaction with everyone has to be a direct preaching interaction that can also happen but that may take time sir chetan mahaprabhu didn't directly start preaching to the advaitavadis first he established a relationship and that relationship was based on shared concerns points of agreement so for a politician or for any mainstream forum they are not really concerned with our religion but they are concerned with the mainstream concerns so if we talk in their language we speak things which make sense to them then we build bridges so this is you could call not outreach but pre outreach and that pre outreach is very important for creating a foundation for outreach without too much conflict or disruption so mahaprabhu with his ma- the masses the classes did not in large number became devotees the few became the who became very influential the few who don't become but they become favorable they are also influential in their way so the prabhupada also later years of his life would look forward to meet with the leaders of society intellectual leaders religious leaders social leaders and he has conversations with them and we see that prabhupada in those conversations is not telling him you have to start chanting hari krishna prabhupada discusses rational philosophy with them. and the purpose is not to convert them the purpose is to get them to appreciate <laughs> if they become devotees that's great but if they don't they just appreciate bhakti philosophy that can also go a long way mr prabhupada started the bhaktivedanta institute that is institute of scientific outreach his purpose was 
it, we sh this should increase the prestige of this school. Scientific outreach does not mean that the scientists have to start chanting 16 rounds. If they do, great. If they don't, they just don't appreciate it. This Bhakti wisdom has, a, has, a, has a, it's quite a rational basis to it. Okay. One statement like that from them can open the minds of many more people. There are some people for whom you open the doors so that they come to Bhakti. But there are others who open the doors for us to take Bhakti to others. Those who are opening the doors, they themselves may never become devotees or they may just become favorable. But they may open the doors for us to take Bhakti to hundreds of thousands of people. And the greatest example of this in our moment's history is here in the UK itself, George Harrison. Now, in one sense, George Harrison was a devotee. Prabhupada did push it. Like sometimes somebody is ready to open the door for us, but we are not concerned that they have opened the doors, we are trying to pull them inside the door. We say, I don't want to come in. And then he pull them and they don't want to, they feel they are pushed and then they close the door for us also. So not everybody has to come into the house of Bhakti. They may not be ready then. So some devotees want by pushing George Harrison, move into the temple. Prabhupada no, no need for you to do that. You continue what you are doing. And you add some devotional songs over there. There is a conversation of Prabhupada with George Harrison which is not there to chant Hare Krishna and be happy book. So, because that's a long conversation. That one time George Hazel comes to Prabhupada and he says, Prabhupada, when I am singing devotional songs, you know, it seems so many people are becoming displeased with me. He says, why is that? He says, basically, if somebody is a musician, they are expected to excel in their musical performance. So when he got too much into bhakti, then what happened was, he started composing songs which were too devotional and they were not of the kind which people would expect, not of the quality, and he started getting very negative reviews. And one time, in a big Madison Avenue, he was doing a, cons uh, he was doing a performance, and people started jeering him. And he started saying that he told Prabhupada, "I feel for every one person I'm bringing to Krishna, I think a dozen people I'm pushing away from Krishna." Just to understand this context, say, say in India and UK, uh, cricket is quite big. So suppose there is some big, it's a big cricket player. Say in India, somebody like uh, Kohli or here, who else? And so the biggest cricket player is there, and then the biggest match, maybe the World Cup final is there. And then the World Cup final, say India plays very poorly, India loses the match. And after the post match interview, <coughs> the interviewer comes and asks, What happened? And say, India's star player says that. Say, Virat Kohli, suppose he's a devotee. And he says, Actually, you know, cricket, it's all Maya. Which is the chant Hare Krishna and be happy. The chant Hare Krishna and be happy is a valid instruction. It is, it is an important limb of preaching. But speaking it at that time would be the worst form of anti-preaching. When people think this was a good cricketer, star cricketer, and because of Hare Krishna, he got ruined completely. So, there is a time for preaching and a time for not preaching. So Prabhupada told George Harrison, and then he says, you do what is required. You compose songs, which will, basically, I'm paraphrasing what Prabhupada said, Prabhupada, you compose songs which will reach, which will bring people to Krishna. But then what he started doing was, he started composing some ordinary songs, what we call mundane songs, and in between you bring some bhakti themes. And then soon he became popular. And people started saying, oh, George Harrison has come out of this Hare Krishna cult. That is a phase. And thank God he has come out of the phase. So he, if you read his interview in the Chandra Hare Krishna, you will see that he is a, he has devotional understanding and he called himself like a closeted devotee, concealed devotee. So there is there are different forms of outreach. And he opened the door for millions and millions of people to be exposed to Krishna. And because Prabhupada didn't pull him into the door, what happened was he was able to reach to more and more people. Or we, we were able to reach to more and more people through him. So that is that is the dynamic of class outreach. It's not so much about pulling those who are in the class, but also getting them to open the door so that they can help us to reach various people. So I'll summarize. I spoke three main points. First was the philosophical perspective that the Mayavadis, the Brahmavadis simply say at Brahman that the impersonal personal aspects are there, but the personal is not what we prefer, the impersonal is what we prefer. Now the Vaishnava understanding, which is based on scripture, is that the personal and impersonal are both aspects of the same absolute truth. Like the same Gulab Jamun experience at the level of smell or 
sight or taste. Like they have the same absolute truth, experience at the level of eternity or eternity and cognizance, eternity, cognizance and ecstasy. That's Brahman Paramatma Bhagavan. But the Mayavadi is what they say, at the level of Mayavadi, they say Brahman is not only highest reality, it is the only reality. And Maya, sorry, and even Bhagwan, Jagat, Jiva, all of these are Maya, which you need to be transcended. The Bhagwan is just a useful fiction, which needs to be transcended. And this is offensive. And they think that anybody who is worshipping Bhagwan is a sentimental person, less sentimental person. And that was the conception that they were having when they treated with Mahabharata. Then I discuss the second part of the historical aspect. That I explained how as Bhakti became more and more influential, the Maya was also trying to recognize that it's not just sentiment, the philosophers also are practicing it. And Mahaprabhu, we talked about how Mahaprabhu, when he was reaching out, he started with the point of intersect, inter, inter, sort of commonality. He didn't say, yes, you are, you are wrong and you are offenders. There is no incident of Mahaprabhu telling a Mayavadi, you are offensive. He just started, he respected them as sannyasis, he put himself in a humble position, he reinforced their conception that, yeah, Maybe this person does intelligence, that's why he's practicing with he's following this guru. He, he's so attractive, so perfect. So he endeared himself by his behavior and brilliance. And then when his intellectual brilliance came, that was just knocked them out completely. So outreach is not just about intellectually convincing others, it's also about the opening the hearts of others. And the last part we talked about was the contemporary part. And the content. So here I discussed how we don't, if people see us only as chanting and dancing on the streets, then they will think that we are less like what are the jolly bunch of impractical people. So we need to be able to present ourselves in multiple ways. Just as Mahaprabhu had class out, mass outreach and class outreach. So we also need class outreach. And class outreach, that is what led to the lasting legacy of Mahaprabhu's uh, mission. And so class outreach may not be very widespread, it may not reach to a lot of people, and it may not transform a lot of people entirely. There are some people, for most outreach means we open the door for people to come to Krishna. But class outreach may mean we just stay connected with people who are ready to open the door for us to take Krishna to us. And that is what has been historically done in the UK during Prabhupada's times to your Jaisan and even now. And that's how we have not just significant outreach but also a significantly favorable environment for outreach. And that is also a success of outreach. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Are there any questions or comments? Yes, please. Thank you, Chesham Shah, for a very fascinating lecture. Thank you, Shah. I have um, on the point of um, philosophy, um, Vaishnav philosophy, mainly the devotee was discussing recently, and I thought you might be the best person to answer in a very su su succinct way. Now there's these different, um, within Vaishnavism, there's Pishtat Rita of Ramanuja, Dwaita of Madhavacharya, and Dwaita Dwaita of Mimbaka, and Shuga Dwaita. Well, that, well, that could be a whole seminar in itself, but could you help, us, uh, help me to understand in a succinct way the difference between these different philosophies, the different Vaishnav philosophies, if it's possible in the time we have? <laughs> if not, yeah. yeah, it's difficult, but it's a, it's a bit technical. So I'll, I'll put it in, a little bit in a historical context. Other than going to technicalities, I'll, I'll put it in a historical context and then a little bit technicality I'll talk about. It. See, like I said, in general, if a person has a particular misconception, it's not immediately possible to change their conception completely. It is generally gradual. So the idea is that we consider the pendulum of philosophy that there was historically Advaitavad that started from the 7th century. Mm. So now the, it was so influential that everything is one. Brahman is the ultimate reality. Now Advaitavad also came because uh, Buddhism had spread very widely and, Maha, and Shankaracharya used Advaitavad to bring everybody under the Vedic fold, a large number of, a large, large part of India back under the Vedic fold. And in many ways, Shankara's, Shankaracharya's Brahman was very similar to Buddhism Shunya. Hmm? 
So basically, he brought people from the Vedic, from the outside the Vedic fold to the Vedic fold. Now, after that, he could say the pendulum swung this way. Now, here, when the pendulum came, this is this is Vishishta Advaita. So Vishishta Advaita. So that is the idea that yeah, it's everything is one, but there's a difference also. Advaita is there, but Vishishta, qualified oneness. So his idea is so the, the defining metaphor of of uh, Shankaracharya, not the mini metaphor, but one of the defining metaphors was that it's like the sky exists everywhere, Brahman exists everywhere. And sometimes the sky, some, some you can call it sky, the air, whatever it is, it's put in a pot. A small pot, there's a big pot. Hmm? But now the, if you want to break a pot, get a small pot and hit it against a big pot. So eventually the collision is big enough, not only the small pot will break, even the big pot will break. So they say, first if you hit the small pot against the big pot, the small pot breaks. And then eventually the big pot also breaks. So, so the idea is that a small pot is Jiva, the big pot is Brahman, is Bhagwan sir. So when you practice Bhakti, the Jiva's sense of I ness dissolves. And then eventually, that like the, the small pot breaks. And then the then the then the, and the sense that there is Bhagwan, that also dissolves. And then all that exists is the sky everywhere. Or you can say air or whatever you want to say, ether. Uh, the Kama in Sanskrit is translated differently in, in English. So that is a defining metaphor. That the sky is the reality and the sky is contained in small, small pots or boxes and the boxes pots need to be broken. And now Shankaracharya, now when Ramacharya came, Ramacharya critiqued Shankaracharya in many ways, Shankaracharya's teachings. But so the defining meta metaphor of the of Ishishtha Advaitavar is the body and the soul. That they say, in one sense, the body and the soul are the same. Because the body and soul are a composite unit when functioning in the world. We may say, I am the soul, but I cannot function without the body. I need the body for functioning in the world. So, is it, yeah, the body and the soul are one as a unit, but they have a difference also. And ultimate, they also agree that the soul is the ultimate reality. So like that, their idea is that there is the material world, there is the jiva, so the, the jiva and the Prakriti, both of them are like the body of the Supreme Lord, who is the soul. But their understanding is this exists together. So that is, so it's basically, oneness is there, but there is a difference. That is qualified. Now, if from there the pendulum went right to... something I need to do. Sorry? Why screen? Okay, anyway, the pendulum goes this way to the other side. You can't see yeah. us. Okay. Anyway, the pendulum goes to the other side. And there, that is Dvaitavad. The Dvaitavad, Shankar Madhacharya came and said, He, and there is no oneness at all. He said that three basic categories of existence. That, that, that 30 chapter talks about nature, the enjoyment, consciousness. Basically, then Ishwara, Jiva and Prakriti. So Shankaracharya talks about Pancham Bhed. Sorry, Madhacharya talks about Pancham Bhed, the five differences. So he said that Ishwara and Jiva are different. Ishwara and Prakriti are different. Jiva and Prakriti are different. Jiva and Jiva are also different. And then Prakriti and Prakriti is also different. So he said there is no such idea of oneness at all. It's all Dvaita. There is duality. Hmm. So uh, Madhacharya's teachings come very close to, according to some thinkers, what is in the Western philosophy is called substance dualism. There are different substances that exist. Mm -hmm. And they exist eternally. So in his idea, liberation means that the matter is also eternal, but the soul becomes disentangled for matter. So that was the pendulum going to the other side completely. Now after that, there is a as I say, Shuddha Advaita and Vishishta and then we have Chinta Veda Veda. So basically Chinta Veda Veda brought the pendulum back to the middle. And in many ways, our philosophy, Gaudiya philosophy is actually very close to the Sri Vaishnava philosophy. Mm -hmm. Although officially Mahaprabhu took initiation from the, uh, from the Advaita Sampradaya, but theologically and philosophically both, we are much closer to uh, Vishishtha Advaita Vad than to Advaita Vad. So the, pen, so the pendulum is here, it comes here, it goes there, then it comes back here. 
then it's at a more stable level. Just get the pendulum from here, then because of the past momentum, it won't be stable over there. It goes from here to here, it goes here, and it comes back. So, Baldevi Javujan's commentary on the Vedanta Sutra, although it is a later commentary, uh, it, is, it is considered an extraordinarily deep commentary, where he has taken the insights from the previous commentators, Shankaracharya, Namacharya, Ambacharya, all of them, and he has bent on them. And the insight that is given is brilliant. So, so in the Gaudiya tradition, the defining metaphor, many again, but one of the defining metaphors is of the sun. That the sun or the fire, fire gives light. The fire burns. Now burning is not possible without fire. But at the same time, fire and burning are two different things. There is the energy and there is the action of the energy. Or rather there is the energetic and the energy. The two are not different. Because there is no conception of fire which it doesn't burn. And burning is not possible without fire. Some form of fire has to be there. At the same time, fire and burning are different. So like that, the jiva can't exist without God. The fire is like God, is the energy. And the jiva and prakriti are like the energy. The Bhagwan is like is the energy source. And everything is the energy. But the point is that while one does not exist without the other, at the same time, there is a relationship of subordination. And it is, burning is a property that is predicated on fire. Similarly, the existence of all living beings, existence of nature, but in nature also, is, is predicated on the existence of the supreme reality. That is the one. So that is the, there is a quick overview. We could go into technicality some other time. Okay. Thank you so yes, much. And I just reflect on that. So you said, I saw Advaita, but they don't distinguish between external, internal, and marginal enemies. Sorry? Did I understood that correctly? So Advaita, yeah, they don't. They say oh, it's all Maya. Everything is one energy, and so in the middle. Oh, no, they don't have the idea of energy at all. They say it's all Maya. It's all Maya. Only Brahman is real. So not only are the energy, not only are there no energies, even the energetic source is also Maya. Bhagwan is also Maya, the external energy, internal energy, intermediate inter energy, all of them are also Maya. They acknowledge that scripture says these things, but they say all such scriptural statements which talk about duality, the difference between the Jiva and the, between Bhakta and Bhagwan, all these statements are a lower level. They are they call, they call them Laghu Vakya. A lower level statement, Maha Vakya are then the great truths. And Mahavakya, those who talk about the oneness of everything. Ramacharya challenges, this is like a very self-serving interpretation. It's like a person has made a hundred statements, say these five are the most important. And why are the, which are the five most important? Which agree with my ideas. Like, there was one, inter one, we were having an interfaith conference once and I was a part of it. A Christian pastor, he was telling how people's views have changed. He was after, on a radio show, and then one person who came on the radio show says, I, I, I'm a Christian. I don't go to any church, but I'm a Christian. So this pastor said, I respectfully asked him, Is there any reason why you don't go to any church? He says, I haven't yet found a church that agrees with my philosophy. <laughs> 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 so, that means, so what, what Advaita Vat does is, rather than studying the Vedic teachings and understanding the Vedic teachings, I already have a philosophy, philosophy that everything is one. And I find from the scripture, those statements which say only that, and say, this is the higher reality, everything else is lower reality. That's why Prabhupada said, that kind of interpretation is not Bhagavad Gita as it is, it is Bhagavad Gita as you want it to be. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, sorry about the subject and object in the stream of consciousness. Um, yeah. Thank you for, for a nice class. The subject and ob object in the stream of consciousness between, but how can the stream of consciousness be conscious if it would just be like light and sound and so forth between? That, that, that's the mystery. Basically, the idea is that the stream of consciousness is the only reality. That is also the Buddhistic idea. The Buddhists also, they say that the self is Maya. They have something called Anattavad. But if the self is self is illusion, then who is actually perceiving? You say, no, that, that, it's just perception. That, uh, that, that it's, it's perception is meaningless without a perceiver. 
that's one of the arguments of the Vaishnava Acharya also that you know, if the sense of self is lost in liberation, then what? who is liberated? If I don't even exist as a self, then what is the point of saying I am liberated? There's no I. So that is that is a this is a philosophical problem. But their idea is that Brahman is simply existence. Mm -hmm. And it's a stream of consciousness that exists forever, that pervades all of existence. So it's a so their idea is that all perception and all object of perception is something like all our illusion. And this is the stream of perception is the only reality. So that is uh, it it doesn't make much sense in terms of empirical experience at all. Not the empirical experience. Logically it doesn't make sense. And scripturally also it's there's a lot of verses which contradict that idea. Any other questions? Yes. Thank you for such a divine talk. Um, I took my daughters to a retreat with London Buddhist Centre when they were little and they spoke about the deity White Tara. Did I do a Mayavadi activity or did I do a Brahmavadi activity and how would I know which one I did? <laughs> See, if, if you take our children to Brahm, have some kind of Buddhist program, how do you know that is Mayavadi or Brahmavadi? So in general, one doesn't have to worry too much about it. Because see, there is there are many people who may be affiliated with Mayavadi organization. But quite often, such people are not so much Mayavadis as they are under some Mayavadi influence. That means they may go to a program like that. They may even be regularly participating in some in person organizing programs. But they may not be going there because of the philosophy. They may be going there because the, the, I, I like the cultural atmosphere, the good people over there, they're doing some humanitarian work. So when people come to philosophy, or sorry, when people come to a spiritual path, it is not, not many people come because of the philosophy. Many people come because of many reasons other than the philosophy. And even Mayavadis, when they are speaking philosophy to common people, they don't really speak Advaita Mayavad so much. Just speak some basic philosophy, oh, we can feel, especially with respect to Buddhism. Most people today practice Buddhism because it seems, uh, it seems so peaceful, it seems so non-violent. And their idea is that this is, I can be religious or I can, I can be spiritual but without being religious. Because I don't have, there's no new concept of God over there so much. So it's more like people want to come to Satmogona. And most people who join such organizations like this, they are going there for the sat experience of Sattva rather than the experience of Advaita. Because they don't even know what is Advaita or Shunya. They just want to feel peaceful. And many of these monasteries or their ashrams or their retreats, they do give people a sense of peace. So we don't have to bother too much about that. Unless, uh, unless a person is downright preaching Mayava directly. It is Mayavad Bhashya Shunile. It is when Mayavad is start preaching Mayavad, that's the problem. But otherwise, at a functional level, sometimes we may be a, we may be, we go to some, we go to some social get together, and maybe our relative, friend, acquaintance, they belong to some Mayavadi organization. So unless they are preaching Mayavad, it's not, it's not a very harmful effect. When Prabhupada who had this, when Prabhupada went to America, he was staying at the Mishra Yoga Studio. And this Mishra was a, he was a follower of Shankaracharya, he was more of Mayavadi. And Prabhupada stayed at the time for some place and then he went to the Lower East Side. Many years later, when he's gone, and we will establish, this uh, Mishra came to meet Shri Prabhupada. And Prabhupada had lunch with him and they talked, they had a long discussion and they chatted. And then Giriraj Maharaj, he was serving Prabhupada at that time, he asked Prabhupada, Prabhupada, I thought he was a Mayavadi. And Prabhupada said, philosophically, we argue like anything, but culturally, we are friends. So, Prabhupada was not affected by the Mayavad. So that's why we don't have to uh, consider Mayavad to be like a like a more malignant version of Covid. Just touch. <laughs> <laughs> not like that. 
Now, you see, Mahaprabhu was also respectful to Mayavadi. He respected, he offered respect to them. So it is only when Mayavadi start preaching Mayavadi. That means they start, the sins are deriding the form of the Lord. You see, the Lord of form of the Lord is Maya and you have to go beyond that. Then, then the can problem. But otherwise, that is just one experience which they had. And mostly for them it was the experience of Sattva, which may open their mind to something higher, something spiritual. Thank you. Thank you. My last question. Well, um, uh, I don't know if I can, I sort of grasped, grasped everything. Uh, mine's like, I have five minutes. So if you come down on the slide, I want to talk about the communication. So further down, further down. Down or up? No, up for you. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. show me up. Okay. Yeah, that's the bit. Um, so <laughs> I'm talking, Achar is Prachar. So I, I'd like you, I, it's nice that you, I mean, this is the first time I'm seeing somebody talking about relational uh, intelligence and intellectual intelligence. And when you're giving a talk, I think that's quite effective. Um, can you talk a little bit more about it so, so that we can be effective preachers? How, how we can connect the audience, how, some more tips if you can give mm, yeah. about this. Okay, so how can we be more effective in our outreach? Well, the, sometimes we think that the people have some misconception and I have to correct that misconception. And that is, what, that is what outreach is about. It is true, but that is not the only thing that outreach is about. Because we may think it's a misconception and we have to remove, we have to remove that. But people are not like computers. Like you have, a, you have some wrong data, you just delete the data and put some new data over there. Even when people have opinions, people have conceptions, they form bonds with those conceptions and opinions. And for them to unbond themselves, to instill themselves, it takes time. So, to put it another way, it's like, say, suppose somebody is on one tower or one peak. And say, so this is the Bhakti tower. And say, this is some other tower. It could be the impersonal tower, it could be the, the tower of uh, worship of devatas, devata worship, it could be some other religion, it could be even science, rationality. So, tower, I'm saying the tower means they are they have been practicing that, they are well established in that in some way or the other. So now if we are to connect with them, sometimes we think all that we need to do is just destroy this tower. It's prove how a person is wrong. But if you just destroy this tower, all that will happen is, if they are here, they will just fall down. Or, if they don't want to, they want that tower to be destroyed, we will just end up destroying our relationship with them. And then they will go away from us. Hmm? And this is what happens. That many people think that we are just fanatical people. That we think we are the only right and everybody else is wrong. That's not true. Our understanding is yeah, even devta worship has validity. Even impersonalism has validity. But it's just that it is not the highest. So what we need to do is, if they are on one tower and we are on another tower, the first thing we need to do is build a bridge. So that, that person who is here, that person starts exploring over here. And so we build a bridge to get the person across. Now, how do we build the bridge? By starting with commonalities. Say, if somebody has come from India and they say, oh, I worship this Baba, or I, I follow this organization, I worship this, or I do that. Or somebody has come from India background, not even from India, then, okay, it's good that you're spiritual. Now, not many people are so spiritual in this line today. And it's good that, you know, we, we also have this spiritual atmosphere, we also have systematic classes and education, we have beautiful kirtans. Please come and join. So basically what we do is, we don't have to start by criticizing them. Criticizing their misconceptions. We start by appreciating what is spiritual on them. And just fan their spirituality. Now by this what will happen is, eventually as they experience Krishna more and more, when they experience Krishna, they will be attracted more and more to Krishna. Sometimes we think it is my responsibility to remove people's misconceptions. No. And Prabhupada was once, once asked, no, Prabhupada, how did he spread Krishna consciousness all over the world? Prabhupada said, Krishna is all attractive. I just presented him, he attracted everybody. 
So that means we need to give people this experience of Krishna. There are many kinds of experiences. It could be a intellectual experience, like some devotees are giving class, Bangalore classes. It could be kirtan experience, darshan experience. For many people, seva experience. Prashadam, of course. Seva experience. You know, some people, nowadays many people like to do some good work. I want to give back to society. I want to be a volunteer. I want to be a part of something bigger than myself. So if somebody does, if you say we are doing food for like something like that, somebody comes along and well, serves over there, they say, hey, these are nice people. They don't be challenging their mayavad, but they get good experience. And when they get good experience, what is happening is, they are just walking on this road. And eventually, when they have come to here, then that is the time you can break this bridge. Mm -hmm. That means that is the time when, their when they have developed sufficient faith in us, then their faith in something else can be challenged. Now, if we, before we build the bridge, only start challenging their faith, they will stay there, there, where they are, or they will go further away from us. The worst thing that we can do is, they are halfway on the bridge, and then we break the bridge. <laughs> they, they are neither here nor there. Hmm? Somebody was worshipping a devata, they start coming to Krishna, and only Krishna, everything else is less intelligent. And then they become confused, you know, this religious, religious business seems to be very confusing, you know, different people get different things. Better let me forget this religious business, I'll become atheistic. <laughs> and we have ended up doing a disservice to them. So what we need to do is, that suppose somebody is, let's say somebody is in great cold, you know, and they just have a, they just have like a torn, tattered sheet, you know, thin, torn, tattered sheet, but they just have protection from the cold. And then well, we want to give them a thick, comfortable blanket. But they, the only experience of relief from the cold that they have is that sheet. And if we try to pull that sheet away from them, they will fight with their life for it. But instead, just put this blanket around them. And they will experience this relief. And then once they experience that relief, and they say, this is so good. Do I need that sheet? So basically, that torn sheet is like any generic spiritual experience. What people consider spiritual experience. So I did some deep breathing, I, I did some laughter therapy, I did some aroma therapy. People have so many ideas of what spirituality is nowadays. Mm -hmm. And now, actually the point is, many of these things, when people are in Rajoguna or Tamoguna, they experience some sattva, they experience some peace, and they think that is spiritual. So they have had some experience of relief from the agitations of their mind. And that's like, you know, you could find so many holes in whatever their philosophy is, whatever their experience is. But it, it's the sheet, it has many holes in that sheet, but that is the only sheet they have for experiencing relief from the cold, from the agitation of their mind, the anxiety, the cravings, the frustrations. So bhakti can give much better experience. So this thick blanket, it is bhakti. So bhakti spiritual experiences are far richer. So if we just give people the opportunity to experience bhakti, not that when they come to a temple everybody is preaching to them. No, just let them experience Krishna. Let them come and sit in Kirtan, let them hear some class. Now that they are forced to do something, let them experience. Then they will themselves see that, hey, this is much deeper, this is much sweeter, this is much richer. And then they will, they will themselves give up their spiritual concept, previous spiritual conceptions. So, the idea is that, I conclude this point with that, you know, we know our responsibility is not just to speak the truth. Our responsibility is to inspire people to seek the truth. Mm -hmm. We may speak the truth, but if we speak it in a way that people find it very agitating, people find it very disruptive, then they will go away from the truth. So our speaking does not necessarily have to tell the complete truth at right at the beginning. But if our speaking is inspired to seeking for the truth in them, then they will inquire, as they inquire, they will say, hey, this makes better sense, this doesn't make sense. And they will move forward. So the idea is understand where the person is and what can get that person forward from where they are. How can we create a seeking for the truth in them? 
It's when we think I have to speak the whole truth to this person. Then much of what we consider the whole truth that contradicts their understanding of truth and then they get confused. They become alienated. So we understand that the spiritual journey is a long journey and it's not that we have to take them across the whole journey. Just inspire them to take steps forward and then they will move forward. Okay. Thank you so much. I just want to know one more. How is Brahma Kumari's How is Brahma Kumari's different from this? Is it the same? Well, you know, once you start going to specific organizations, it becomes a little complicated. Because two reasons. First of all, that the, every organization has its own philosophy. But then not every organization organizes the philosophy in a very organized way. You know, their teacher, their te one teacher might say this, and one teacher might say that, and one teacher might say that. So somebody might take one aspect of the teaching and they say, all my ideas. Somebody will say, you know, there's a problem. So it's, it's unless they have a very well-organized, coherent philosophy, it's very difficult to make a philosophical evaluation of who they are or where they are. And more importantly, that when people are belonging to, are joining a political organization, how much they are affected by its philosophy, it's very difficult to see. So, my understanding is that, in general, just find where there is commonality and build on that. If we want to, there can be a serious discussion and some serious study in order to try to understand what are the philosophical similarities and differences and uh, where things are in alignment with scripture, things are not. But, in general, it's, it becomes very volatile and polarizing. When you start specific things, start taking specific organizations and start making summaries and judgments about them in a very blanket way. So thank you very much. Gantra Jatan Chatta Amrit Ki Jai Prabhupad Ki Jai Gaur Bhakti Vrind Ki Jai Gaur Primaan Jai 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 Jai